eight episodes in. Wow, it's been quite a trek, everyone. But hey, all good things must come to an end, and with a heavy heart, I must say that this will be the last episode of my Let's Learn Public Health series. And embarrassingly, I only found out yesterday that there is already a series on YouTube with the exact same name, or rather the, the channel's name. Oh my god, how awkward. But before I bid this series a fond farewell, we still have this last episode. And the topic for today is none other than public health in the news. As you can imagine, most of today's articles will be focused on COVID and COVID adjacent subjects, but I'm going to try to introduce you to a variety of news headlines that will paint a broader picture. Let's jump in. It is my aim today to discuss three articles in some depth and detail, each from different sources so as to add some flavor to our public health palette. First up on the list is from Science Daily, and the article is, Researchers call for greater clarity over what constitutes a mental health problem. I wish to highlight this article's title as well as its content. Only in recent years have we seen such an institutionalized highlighting of mental health that has bled over into our greater cultural understanding of, like the title says, what exactly constitutes a mental health problem. Along with concepts such as self-care, a phrase I think has become diluted in some circles, we now, more than ever, are trying to focus on holistic models of healthcare instead of either solely focusing on physical health or minimizing and or demonizing those with mental health issues. On to the meat of the article. This source comes to us from the University of Bath in the UK, who worked in tandem with the Bern University of Applied Sciences in Switzerland. The main crux of the article's focus is how there are a multitude of methods and models used to assess a person for a mental health condition, but the sheer amount of available models causes systemic confusion for those diagnosing and treating mental health problems. A lack of consistency among the models with no one conclusive definitive best practice or model has caused a lack of consistency when evaluating a client's mental health. This discrepancy, or rather, this lack of collusion, also exists in research. Upon analyzing a hundred publications for the phrase, mental health problems, the researchers found that there were 34 different theories, methods, and practices used by mental health services to diagnose and interpret mental health issues. Quote, These range from biological models, focusing on problems with the brain or body, to psychological, focusing on the mind and behavior, sociological, focusing on how social circumstances affect people, to models which were informed by consumer and cultural considerations, which reflect the experiences of people who have been treated by mental health services and consider how treatment should be adapted to different cultures." End quote. Previously, policymakers and practitioners all tried to come to a consensus by following the biopsychosocial axis which seems to be a catch-all term for a holistic approach to evaluating mental health conditions and treating them. But even that consensus is not holding together, given its serious lack of definitive expression of purpose, opting instead to crunch as many types of theories as possible to be inclusive in a clunky way. According to the Mental Health Foundation, one in six people will experience a mental health disruption in a week's time but the lack of standardization could result in less comprehensive care due to the way the symptoms and signs are measured and discussed. We've seen an uptick in the amount of conditions being placed into and updated in manuals like the DSM. Professor Dirk Richter from the Bern University of Applied Sciences says, quote, questions such as, what are mental health problems or what counts as mental illness have impacts within healthcare systems. They can affect decisions around who might receive a mental health service and how behaviors such as aggression might be interpreted." End quote. A large problem with giving each patient or client their own free will to use certain models is that non-clinical models could potentially overrun the community, with unsubstantiated evidence to support their use in a professional setting. The article also adds that psychologists, psychiatrists, therapists, etc. 
could undermine the use of a patient chosen model and downplay its importance, opting to use a totally different model instead. As a counterbalance to this, Dr. Dixon, another member of the research team, said that nurses, social workers, and other tertiary mental health workers, and the clientele themselves, should have their own opinions heard, since a non-clinical view is needed that doesn't account for the use of the typical catch-all model. A fresh perspective is sorely needed, says the research team, if a person is going to use a service for their own health, they need to be able to offer a more individualized plan tailored to their needs that doesn't try to fit everyone into a cramped checklist that purports to be more inclusive than is. To conclude, I would like to briefly discuss how in recent years we've seen a push away from primarily a paternalistic approach to healthcare ethics and an increase in patient-centered care. This increase in autonomy is critical, and in this case we can see researchers calling for it in an academic and clinical setting both in research and in practice. Maternalistic approach is a past where a doctor would advise a patient and have an all-knowing benign authority to prescribe whatever treatment severely lacked patient input in their own care. Of course, physicians should not have their knowledge and expertise discounted, but flexibility in public health is essential as not all populations, especially on a cultural level in the case of mental health, where there are many differences, need the same thing. Equity, remember? Seeing a greater push for patient-centered justice in the mental health sphere in regards to ethics at a baser level of interpretation is very refreshing to see. The next article we'll cover today comes to us from the Kaiser Health News website. The news website for Kaiser Permanente, a managed care organization and one of the oldest in the U.S. The title reads, as politics infects public health, private companies profit. The author of the article is Vingesh Ramachandran, whose first name and surname I probably just butchered so badly right now. Apologies. The primary focus of this story is to discuss the relationship between public health organizations and the agencies adjacent to them in elected government. These governmental, local and state alike, often have differing opinions and when they do, trouble can erupt. We also turn our attention towards private companies that stand to use the pandemic's sordid state of affairs to make a killer profit. In Douglas County, Colorado and West Covina, California, there are interested parties who are planning to splinter off from their official public health departments and form their own health departments due to mask mandates and general public safety advice and policies. Douglas County apparently also has one of the highest median household incomes in the entire country, so this further highlights that having the privilege to simply opt not to follow public health protocols when it suits you is a tool for those who can afford to flounder, whereas poorer folks cannot expect the same degree of leniency. The county commissioners voted unanimously to form their own health department in the face of a September 2021 mask mandate. Douglas County now plans to entirely phase out of its agreement with the Tri-County Health Department it shares with two other adjacent counties, planning to be fully independent by the year's end. The county's officials have now contracted an agreement worth $1.5 million with the private healthcare consultant, Jorgen Health Solutions. A spokesperson from the county cited, quote, differing and competing public health demands, end quote, as one of the reasons for leaving the agreement. In West Covina, a periphery city to LA, representatives have pulled out of their relationship with the Los Angeles County Health Department over differing opinions regarding quarantine and COVID isolation shutdowns. The main critique is that LA, the huge conglomerate of a city that it is with millions of people, has a COVID policy that doesn't cater to the smaller West Covina and that the city hasn't had its opinions listened to by the LA County Health Department. They plan to join Long Beach, Pasadena, and Berkeley as the cities in California with their own health departments, though a date hasn't been finalized. They do, however, have a company picked out to contract citywide healthcare engineering projects, and that company is TransTech Engineers. The hope here is to ideally break up the county's massive amounts of people and cities into smaller chunks for better, more personalized management. So 
some caution against the split because, simply put, going elsewhere into a private contractor's hold won't ensure the necessary resources are distributed or the plans will hash out with more speed and efficiency, or even that you'll necessarily see better outcomes. You may get your say, sure, but will it be effective is the key question. It's very difficult to create a health department out of thin air. The time and resources, not to mention the money needed, is a lot to spend over anger against the mask mandate. Though of course, we can say this is hardly about a mask mandate anymore. As you know, dear viewers, health departments don't just hand out vaccines and close up shop for the day. They administer well child visits, screen for infectious diseases for workplaces as well as drug tests, are the main go-betweens for water quality and safety, handle WIC, conduct restaurant inspections, the list goes on. A community could see a real downturn in quality of life if these new health departments don't perform up to snuff, especially in LA and its suburbs where there is a huge number of dependent and not so well off members of the community that can't afford to gamble with this type of behavior. As a final remark, the article examines how another private sector takeover of a city's public health system resulted in not so good outcomes for its citizenry. In 2012, Detroit, one of the most financially unstable cities in the country, was on the verge of bankruptcy. In a predatory way, the Institute for Population Health had tried to overcompensate for the public health sector in the city's failing health, but it was not to be. The city just didn't have the money, and so they couldn't fund anything the nonprofit was asking for, and the public health concerns arose as the citizens were left out in the cold. Three years later, control returned back to the city after Detroit got out of bankruptcy. The institute thought it could issue orders that a normal health department or a federal entity could, only to find it couldn't effectively do that. Quote, In Colorado, Tri-County's Deputy Director, Jennifer Ludwig, expresses concerns about Douglas County's creating non-COVID programs essential to the functioning of a public health department. We have programs and services that many single county health departments are not able to do just because of the resources we can tap into, Ludwig said. Building that from scratch is a huge feat and will take many, many, many years." End quote. I'll include a link in the description if you'd like to read about Detroit's public health crisis in greater detail. Moving on, our final article comes to us from Reuters with the title, Malawi Detects Polio, First Wild Case in Africa in Over Five Years. We've talked at length about infectious diseases being a component of public health, and in this case, polio, a disease that in most of the world was wiped out due to mass vaccination efforts, has reappeared in the wild. Note that this is not the first case solely in Malawi, but in the entire continent. Malawi has declared an outbreak, and the new strain is one that hasn't yet been seen in Malawi. A strain from Pakistan that was seen in October 2019, where polio is endemic. And here's a fun fact, the only two countries where polio is endemic are Pakistan and Afghanistan. According to the WHO, who reported on the outbreak, as well as the CDC and South Africa's Institute for Communicable Diseases, the strain of polio is type 1 wild polio, or WPV1, which was contracted by a three-year-old girl in November. This presents a serious health concern. Transmission of polio, a disease that once ravaged the world in record numbers and led to lifelong paralysis, could once again rear its ugly head in an area that's traditionally not very economically advantaged or healthcare advantaged. Distributions of vaccines and education are foremost issues. Luckily, due to disease surveillance, Africa was able to respond well in the past, and they're trying to do so now as well with the rapid mobilization effort. There have only been five cases worldwide of polio last year, and the last case of polio in Africa as a whole was in Nigeria in 2016, a remarkable feat for public health everywhere. Of course, another angle to approach this problem would be to increase vaccination efforts in Pakistan and Afghanistan, but there are numerous barriers to overcome, including financing, health infrastructure, and safety of deployment. Both areas in the past were hard to get to for foreign aid, 
because of warfare and instability, not to mention how that affected the country's own economies and ability to provide widespread public health practices. According to, and again, apologies for the pronunciation, Faisal Sultan, Pakistan's health minister, the genetic cluster had disappeared from the country since around 2019. Quote, Further analysis may reveal its hiding place since then, perhaps somewhere in the world where there are pockets of immunity gap and non-existent environmental surveillance, quote, he said. And these immunity gaps are precisely places that we must ensure get the vaccines they need to develop long-standing herd immunity. Even if that strand is no longer endemic to Pakistan, that doesn't mean it hasn't traveled and it hasn't mutated via antigenic drift. Only with more helpful and comprehensive disease surveillance and vaccination can we see a completely polio-free world. With the Global South having previously been bombarded by austerity policies implemented by the IMF and World Bank, which is a whole different thing, it's a huge topic on its own that isn't necessarily public health related, leading to widespread economic shortages and shortcomings, it's more important than ever that these countries be able to afford the research and supplies to create and distribute the vaccines, as well as enough healthcare workers to administer them. And on that note, we've come to the end of my Let's Learn Public Health series. It's going to be a somber little bookend on this piece for the time being, but I don't discount the possibility of new videos coming out to augment this series in the future. I've had a wonderful time learning about the many vast and varied aspects of public health, and I hope along the way you too have enjoyed yourself and learned something new. Thank you all for sticking with me this far and giving me this opportunity. I'm truly blessed. It's been an honor, everyone. This is Fina from Reveal and Light, and I hope you stay well. Bye-bye. <laughs>